When we left off the last time, we were talking about the emergence of Ronald Reagan as um, kind of the uniter in the political right, uh, the guy that conservatives had been waiting for, really for generations, to emerge uh, that could bring in all of these uh, groups of conservatives that uh, it's not as if they just weren't there throughout the uh, 50s, 60s, and 70s. It's that they were so disorganized and they lacked that one unifying figure, much like Franklin Roosevelt for the Democrats. Um, and that, that's really going to change American politics. Uh, it's going to change American life in the late 70s and early 1980s. We know that Ronald Reagan... Um, cruised to victory in the 1980 election over uh, Jimmy Carter. And one of the things that Ronald Reagan promised to do while he was on the campaign trail was rein in the size of government, make government smaller, and in the process make it uh, uh, more efficient from a financial standpoint. Um, one of the things that Reagan believed was that uh, the, the, the sharp downturn in the economy in the late 1970s was caused uh, in large part anyway, by uh, some of the social programs that had been enacted by Lyndon Johnson in the Great Society and the War on Poverty. And so he, he, he vowed to cut government spending, and in particular wasteful, or what he deemed to be wasteful government spending. Now, in the middle of all this, we see a labor management dispute um, erupt with the Professional Air Traffic Controllers Organization, um, PATCO. Now, who PATCO is are the people that uh, uh, talk to pilots at the airport. They sit in the air traffic control tower and they say, look, uh, why don't you give us a few minutes before you take off or it's okay to land. And in 1980, uh, they had uh, walked out on strike claiming that they, they, that they needed more money. They wanted a raise and they wanted uh, shorter work days, among other things. In any case, in 1981, more or less as one of his first orders of business, Ronald Reagan uh, intervenes in this dispute and he pretty much sends the PATCO workers back to work. He basically breaks this strike. Now, I'm not really in the business of psychoanalyzing uh, sources or anything of that sort, but the thing that I want you to understand about the aftermath of the PATCO strike is that union membership begins to fall like a stone. It begins to plummet. Um, if you're following along with me, uh, I'm on the slide entitled The Reagan Years in Union Membership. What you're going to see is a graph that uh, outlines the second half of the 20th century, and the blue line there is the amount of workers that belong to a union in the private workforce. In other words, these are not government employees. Now, the general trend is declining, but if you take a look at the 1970s, you begin to look at 1975 and beyond, you'll begin to see a downturn in union membership. Um, Part of this is the sluggish economy and people are being laid off. And then if you look at the 1980s, they really begin to fall like a stone, okay? Um, I'm not saying that Ronald Reagan communicated some sort of message to corporate America, but I am saying that it does appear that corporate America looked at the intervention of Reagan and the PATCO strike as more or less a political blessing to come after unions and make it more and more difficult for unions to be formed and unions to remain relevant. Now the question that I want to ask, and it is a question, is the declining of unionism in America, is that significant? Do we need unions? Do workers need unions any longer? I want you to think back throughout the course of our class and Think about what unionism has meant to the people that have uh, uh, flocked to uh, the unions. Okay, um, It is true that a lot of those jobs, uh, manual labor, manufacturing jobs, they're no longer all that relevant. Um, they've either been replaced uh, by machines that do those sorts of jobs or they have been outsourced to uh, lower wage countries altogether. But in general, if you think back to the 1930s and the early 1940s, what unions were, were social spaces for workers that had more or less been marginalized in American life. Uh, racial, ethnic minorities, women, political minorities, they brought all of their grievances, some of which had to do with on-the-job complaints, and some of which were things that were going on in neighborhoods or maybe national politics. 
In any case, the unions became sort of the mouthpiece for these people who otherwise really weren't a high priority for mainstream American politicians. The other thing that I want you to consider here is that unionism really helped to grow the American middle class in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. Now again, take a look at that graph. Okay, What you will notice is that union membership is highest in the 1950s with approximately 33% of the private workforce belonging to some union in the middle of the 1950s. And over the course of the next few decades, unionism begins to decline as does middle class America, okay? I'm not saying that uh, life in America is getting somehow m more difficult. What I am saying is that middle class wage and middle class security that unions more or less mandated was meaningful to the people that belonged to them. And as we get closer and closer to the turn of the 20th century, and unionism becomes thinner and thinner in American life, you're going to see more and more challenges for growing the middle class. What I want to talk about next is something that historians call Reaganisms. Um, a lot of these are Reagan's domestic politics. Now keep in mind, this is a guy that stood for small government, fiscal responsibility, slashing uh, uh, budgets for various programs. Ronald Reagan was not a real big fan of government oversight agencies like the Environmental Protection Agency. Keep in mind, uh, this comes into force under Richard, Richard Nixon, and it's designed to regulate the kind of waste that corporations can dump into water bodies of water or into the atmosphere. Well, Reagan called it a left-wing cult, and in addition to not funding it very well, um, he also put people in charge of it that, like him, did not really like it all that much. So you don't have to be a political scientist here to understand what's going to happen in the not-so-distant future. This is not really going to be a big priority for the Reagan administration in the subsequent years. Reagan also publicly said that he felt that both the Civil Rights Act and the States Rights Act were mistakes. Um, keep in mind that Civil Rights Act of 1964 basically integrated America, or at least gave uh, teeth to the federal government to prosecute individuals that still clung to this idea of Jim Crow discrimination. Reagan claimed that this made the South the laughingstock of uh, uh, American life, and uh, you don't really need the government to, to do this, that uh, uh, businesses and other establishments would uh, ultimately see the light, I guess you could say, and uh, sell products and serve people um, as long as they were paying customers, regardless of race. Okay, So understand that, um, you know, much like Richard Nixon and maybe more overtly George Wallace, uh, there are votes when it comes to this racist uh, uh, um, reactionary segment of American life. If you want smaller government to mean, uh, you know, I'm going to lower your taxes and you won't hear or feel government as much, uh, kind of a, a very generic version of conservatism, then that's what it means. Um, if you want it to mean, I'm going to back away from legislating civil rights, then that's what it means. Uh, the truth was ultimately in the ear of the person that was listening. Okay. Reagan also made it clear that he did not uh, condone an alternative lifestyle, and as such, uh, he did very little to advance the cause uh, of gays, lesbians, or transgendered uh, Americans throughout his presidency. Okay. Now, speaking of the LGBT community, uh, they are going to organize uh, in the 19, late 70s, early 80s, and define themselves as a, an oppressed political minority. Let me make something clear. Homosexuality was prevalent well before the 1980s, but much like a lot of other things in this culture of conformity, it wasn't talked about. It wasn't talked about openly. Um, you know, it was routine for police departments throughout the country to raid known establishments. I'm talking about bars or nightclubs uh, that were known to cater to a homosexual audience. Um, one of the incidents that really brings the issue of homosexuality and um, second-class citizenship to light in the latter half of the 20th century would be an event called the Stonewall Riots. Uh, police officers in New York had raided a gay bar, 
and uh, proceeded to uh, uh, load people up in their squad cars and arrest them for various um, offenses. And uh, ultimately there was a pushback. And this pushback that comes to be known as the Stonewall Riots in 1969 uh, this is really an awakening, so to speak, that there is this group of people. It, it's it's not it's not who we thought that they were, perhaps in the 1950s. Uh, it's much more prevalent um, um, than than we thought it was, and ultimately, this is a real eye-opening experience for people in the United States. Now, in 1973, the American Psychiatric Association. Uh, basically defined being homosexual uh, uh, similarly to a mental disorder. Um, you have, uh, you have uh, uh, movements um, even after this um, um, uh, uh, kind of awakening experience with the Stonewall riots, you have um, campaigns like the Save Our Children campaign that sought to limit uh, 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 gays and lesbians from becoming things like public school teachers, thinking that they could uh, uh, indoctrinate American youth uh, to, to, to embrace this sort of lifestyle, if you will. Now you do have other more uh, um, forward-thinking sorts of campaigns, as for example in Dade County, Florida, Miami, Florida, uh, you begin to see laws that come out that kind of forbid uh, individuals from being discriminated against based solely on sexual orientation. But the real breakthrough, I guess you could call it, for the LGBT community would come in 1978 when Harvey Milk um, from California successfully ran for the uh, San Francisco Board of Supervisors. And Harvey Milk, uh, who had been a, a homosexual activist uh, lobbying for uh, gay rights and equality of citizenship, uh, he becomes one of America's first openly gay politicians uh, in American history. And what he begins to try to do in San Francisco is legislate anti-discriminatory policies. Now this is all well and good, but keep in mind, in California at this particular moment, there are policies like Proposition 6, which is going to limit work for gays and lesbians in public sectors. Okay, So, for example, if you wanted to work for the city government, if you wanted to... Um, you know, become a police officer or maybe a teacher, that, that, that ultimately hinged on your sexual orientation. It's these kind of laws that Harvey Milk is coming out against and trying to get rid of. Uh, 1979, Milk is going to organize uh, a national march on Washington for gay and lesbian rights. And by 1980, um, homosexuals are no longer in the closet, if you will. Uh, civil rights activists uh, in the LGBT community had made a meaningful impact, and this is going to continue to be for the rest of the 20th century, and of course well into the 21st century, this is going to be a major point uh, of a new emerging civil rights movement, broadly defined. But back to the Reagan presidency for a few more moments. Um, keep in mind that one of the things that Ronald Reagan campaigned on was the idea that taxes were just too high. Um, so, coming into office, Reagan was trying to address this issue at the same time that he was trying to get the American economy moving again. Now, of course, Reagan was not the first politician to inherit a, a, a crisis in the economy. Certainly, FDR could uh, relate to things of that sort. But in any case, whereas Franklin Roosevelt aimed at the bottom of the American economy, injecting resources into working class America, into the lower middle class, trying to get people uh, in that realm of the economy spending again to create demand that would bubble up to the top, Ronald Reagan favored something called supply side theory, increased the supply of money. Okay. Now, this is ultimately going to come to be known as Reaganomics. And what Ronald Reagan is going to advocate is not only a tax cut for everybody, but specifically a tax cut for the wealthiest Americans and corporations, right? 
The theory of Reaganomics is if you cut taxes for the people at the very top of the economy, then they will trickle it down to the rest of us. And it comes to be known as trickle-down economics, which is, um, you know, something that you might want to consider writing down next to Reaganomics, trickle-down economics. In any case, it's pretty simple. If you cut taxes for people up here, what they'll do is they'll pay it forward by not only hiring more workers and investing in more research, but they'll build more factories and they'll um, they'll, they'll invest in other realms of the American economy, right? Um, uh, they'll invest in America, generally speaking. Well, that's possible. That's something that they could possibly do, or they could just more or less hoard it. They could sit on it and uh, invest it in the stock market, and um, that, that, that wouldn't exactly trickle down as far as people like Ronald Reagan had hoped. In any case, um, this is going to become a controversial issue, especially with the Democratic Party, and especially with the Speaker of the House of Representatives, a guy by the name of Tip O'Neill, liberal um, um, Democrat from Massachusetts. Tip O'Neill described Reaganomics as welfare for the rich and uh, said that if you made more than $50,000, which back in the 1980s was very upper middle class money, um, then you loved Reaganomics because you got a tax cut. Uh, if you didn't make more than 50000 you really didn't like it considering uh, you weren't seeing as much of a tax cut. And furthermore, they were cutting programs like the Head Start program uh, that a lot of working class families really depended upon. Now, ultimately, Tip O'Neill vowed to fight Reaganomics, and he lost. Um, the Republicans are able to push this through Congress, and Ronald Reagan gets the tax cuts that he wants. Um, now, this sounds all fine and well, and more and more people are keeping more and more of their tax money, or taxable income, I guess you could say. The problem is Ronald Reagan still has essential programs that he needs to support. Now, one of those essential programs is something that he campaigned heavily upon, which was the military. Reagan said, I'll beef up our military because he felt that we were being pushed around by people. So you can't cut the military. You still have that same bill. You could probably even make the case that it's even an even bigger bill. And you've also got social programs that were still crazy popular with the American people. Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, those programs weren't going anywhere. And Ronald Reagan didn't dare touch them. So, um, if you're not taking in the same level of money, um, you're running what we call a budget deficit, you, your, your bills actually exceed and surpass what you generate in revenue, uh, the only thing left to do is to borrow it. And so we begin borrowing huge sums of money uh, as, a, as a government. As a matter of fact, uh, by 1982, those budget deficits are running about the same or very, very close to our entire gross domestic product. All the goods and services that the American economy, and we are the largest economy in the world, all the goods and services that we produced in one fiscal year. This is a really, really concerning issue. I mean, so concerning to the American people that the Democrats actually retook Congress in the 1982 midterm elections. Now, understanding that the American people had spoken and understanding the severity of the situation, Ronald Reagan uh, invited Tip O'Neill over to the White House where the two of them struck a deal. And Reagan himself um, agreed to raise taxes primarily on uh, wealthier and uh, wealthier Americans. And so ultimately, this is kind of uh, the end, not, maybe not the end of an era, but certainly Ronald Reagan really rethinks his whole idea of, uh, of, of just slashing taxes to the bone. Um, you, you, you hear a lot of people on both the left and the right invoke Ronald Reagan, what he meant, what he stood for. If he was here right now, this is what he would do. This is how he would act. Um, what you might not hear is that Reagan raised taxes in his presidency 11 times. He also raised the debt ceiling. Um, that was the amount of money that Congress could borrow so that we could pay our bills. And if you think about it, it's not been that long ago to where government was essentially shut down because there was a fight in Congress as to whether or not we should raise the debt ceiling and um, pay for the things that we've already essentially bought. But for the most part, the American economy in the 1980s does begin to rebound. It, it, it becomes a better economy. And as far as Ronald Reagan was concerned, this return to prosperity can be credited to the economic heroes of the 1980s, people like Lee Iacocca, 
in Detroit who had uh, taken over the Chrysler Corporation, which was more or less on its deathbed uh, in the late 70s, early 1980s. Um, he had secured a big loan from the American government. Uh, not only did he pay it back on time and with interest, the government actually made money on Chrysler, um, but he used that money to really retool uh, American factories here in the United States. And, and Chrysler begins to produce a car, produce a product that, once again, American people want to buy. And so Iacocca is one of these economic heroes that um, that, that Ronald Reagan's got a credit for the rebounding of the economy. So too would a guy by the name of Donald Trump. Um, now what made Donald Trump a household name is the real estate industry, which he really begins to make a splash in New York, right? In the late 1970s, if you've ever read anything or uh, watched a movie about New York in the late 70s, New York was not exactly, a, a, as Times Square in particular, a great place to be. Um, a lot of crime, a lot of vice, a lot of other shady things going on. Well, at the same time, New York used to be a city that you could live in, even if you weren't a millionaire. Um, there were policies known as rent control that, uh, says, that said you could not charge more than this amount of money for rent on a monthly basis. Well, when Trump began buying up, you know, plots of real estate in places like Times Square, really fixing them up to the point where, you know, wealthier people wanted to come back downtown and kind of consume that sort of leisure, what that ultimately did was it got rid of a lot of those rent control measures. And the good part was New York really began to come back. The real estate industry in New York came back. The downside is it, is it really kind of pushed everybody that wasn't independently wealthy, pushed them uh, out of the city. Right. In my opinion, a much more reasonable explanation for the return of prosperity has everything to do with the computer revolution. We don't really understand this today. We really take computers for granted. But um, you know, there was a time when if you were writing a paper, number one, you were doing it on a typewriter. And number two, if you messed up, if you made a grammatical error, or a spelling mistake, or whatever the case was, more times than not, you had to start all over again. So think about how much more productive through the computer revolution we're going to be once you can do things like hit backspace. Um, I mean, think about how much more productive we're going to be once the internet comes out uh, in the 1990s and, 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 and the early 2000s, the perfection of the, uh, the internet, I guess you could say. Um, is sending an email later on, uh, you know, things like Skype and uh, other mass communication uh, uh, digital technologies that's going to make uh, you know the American workforce far more efficient it's going to become much much cheaper to communicate with each other and we're going to become a lot lot more productive okay so a lot like automation this was a good thing prices come down uh, efficiency goes up uh, productivity goes up uh, competition goes up, which is a good thing in a capitalist society, but at the same time, like the process of robots replacing human beings, automation, this is going to put some people out of work, okay? In 1984, Ronald Reagan was up for re-election, and he, uh, his campaign slogan, 484, was, It's morning again in America. In other words, we're past this Vietnam moment. Uh, we have kicked the economic uh, sluggishness of, uh, uh, of the recession, and uh, it's a new day in America. The Democrats ran a guy from Minnesota by the name of Walter Mondale, who, by the way, uh, uh, selected Geraldine Ferraro as his running mate, uh, a, a female vice presidential candidate. And to be quite honest, um, Walter Mondale really was the epitome of a New Deal Democrat. I mean, ties to political machines in the cities, uh, ties to organized labor. And Walter, uh, Walter Mondale gets his teeth handed back to him by Ronald Reagan in the 1984 election. If you're looking at my map uh, on the slide entitled Election of 1984, you'll see, you can't even see, that one of the only electoral votes that he picked up was from Washington, D.C., the District of Columbia, and his own, his own home state of Minnesota, right? So Reagan's going to win by a landslide, and this election is going to reconfirm what we already knew through the Reagan Revolution that by 1980, certainly by 1984, we're a conservative country. There are more conservative Americans uh, than there are liberal Americans, okay? Back to the long-term impact of Reagan's economic policies, however. 
We know that there was a process known as deindustrialization. It really began in the early 1970s with the energy crunch. Um, that process of capital flight, uh, manufacturing, moving elsewhere is going to continue. It's going to actually accelerate, but this time it's going to begin to go overseas. Uh, corporations uh, found out pretty quickly that not only could they get the same level of quality product in places like China, um, Taiwan, Mexico, Eastern Europe, you could get the same quality of product, but you could get it for a fraction of the price. Um, countries throughout Central America, they didn't, they didn't have the same kind of labor standards, human rights standards, uh, um, uh, environmental standards that we had in the United States. So naturally it made things much cheaper to do business there and you could sell it for the same price that you had always sold your products back in the United States and Western Europe. So from a corporate perspective, outsourcing, as it comes to be known, it makes perfect sense. We're talking about a global economy, a process known as globalization. These corporations like Sunbeam or General Motors, RCA, they're going to become international organizations beginning in the 1990s, and really they're not going to go back um, to what they were, American companies, really to the point that we're talking about right now. Um, globalization is really going to have a big impact on the American economy because it's going to continue that trend of deindustrialization. And of course, with industry go those middle class jobs that, uh, once again, were so instrumental in the growth of the American uh, middle class. Now, um, I'm, this is all leading into the election of 1988. And in the election of 1988, uh, Reagan's vice president, George H.W. Bush, is going to run for the presidency and the Republican candidate. And he's going to run against a guy from Massachusetts by the name of Michael Dukakis. And similar to Walter Mondale, Dukakis really was your prototypical liberal Democrat. Um, George H.W. Bush um, had a lot in common, at least on the campaign trail, with Ronald Reagan with respect to um, you know, his vision for America. And he was always on point, and one of the things that he would say over and over and over again is, read my lips, no new taxes. And um, he had learned that this message of low taxes, smaller government, tough on crime, you know, strong military had really resonated with the American voter, um, so much so that we had really become a conservative country. And if you're looking at that uh, last slide in this uh, uh, lecture from Reagan to Bush, once again, you're talking about a pretty red map. There's a lot of uh, states, including traditional democratic states, that, uh, that, 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 that have turned red. Okay, so George H.W. Bush is going to be elected in 1988, which will complete the uh, Republican dynasty of the 1980s. Um, in my opinion, the 1980s look an awful lot like the 1920s, not just because you've got back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back Republican administrations, but our, our political orientation, our, our ideas of what government should or should, be, should not be doing are, are kind of the same um, with respect to uh, you know, uh, how much government is too much government. Taxation, um, who, should, who should lead with respect to you know, implementing public policy? Should this be individuals like um, city dwellers, labor activists, or things of that sort, or should it be the business community broadly defined? And so when we come back, we're going to talk more about Ronald Reagan and, uh, to a lesser extent, George H.W. Bush's foreign policy, the way that we interact with other countries under those administrations. And one of the things that we're going to talk about is this end of a Cold War, um, which is going to be, be good, obviously, and, 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 and bad for what I bet a lot of you can assume are obvious reasons as well. So we're almost through the 1980s. And uh, once we get done talking about this foreign policy, I think you'll really understand that this time period in American history is very, very critical to understanding how we live our lives as Americans in our own time in this day and age. So we'll talk about that when we come back.